So yes, hello, I'm Rosanna Aguilera. I'm at UC San Diego. I'm really happy to introduce our first uh, invited speakers for today, who will talk about the La Raza database project and analysis of circumstances of deaths of people of color involving use of deadly force by law enforcement uh, in the US. And today with us are um, Yvette Xochiyotel Boiso, an advocate for mental health, patient, civil, human, and indigenous rights, and uh, the project manager of La Raza Database. And also with us today is um, Jesus Garcia, a demographer with extensive experience in GIS, and also um, uh, he's the lead analyst for the project. Thank you very much to both of you for being here today, and please take it away, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Um... Again, my name is Yvette Suchillot, and I am the project manager for La Raza Database. Um, La Raza Database is a project that was uh, led and started by the late Dr. Simply Rodriguez, also known, uh, his, Roberto Rodriguez, also known as uh, Dr. Simply. Dr. Simply was a professor at University of Arizona, and he was also a survivor of police brutality. Um, he also is one of the first Chicanos ever to fight the charges against the police. And, and, and he won twice. He won two trials. And the reason why he started the research is because he recognized the huge discrepancy in the way the deaths of people of color were being reported by the police. For instance, you will have names like uh, Lopez, Gomez, Hernandez, Martinez in the categories of white, unknown, and other. So in early 2021, he put together a group of around 50 people from all over the country uh, with different expertise areas, with different backgrounds. And this is how we formed La Raza Database. Ultimately, it kind of came down to three of us doing the research. Uh, Jesus, who did such an amazing job with the data in the GIS technology. Calcet San Bernardino, uh, lead, and Dr. Enrique Murillo, who was the person facilitating the meetings between both of us, and um, myself. Then we have people from all over the country with different areas who uh, wrote essays for the database, and you can find that in the final report. I think um, before I pass it on to Jesus, I, I want to emphasize the importance of this type of research. Uh, we kind of just process data from all the open source existing databases, and it's important to, to understand the databases that are existing at this point, they're mostly volunteer based, uh, meaning the government has no standards, no centralized system for the gathering and processing of these data. So the way they report the killings of people of color is basically at the discretion of the officers and the agencies, which has kind of led in a, a vacuum. It, it, there's a vacuum on the way that they report uh, this type of information. And I think uh, it's also a call to action. I, I want you to think throughout this presentation, what can the University of California, what can the UC system do in terms of leading this type of research with the type of uh, system and the platform, the the people, the experts, the students, you know, that it's a whole uh, new area to explore. And unfortunately, if we don't call for legislation to do something and take the lead in terms of this type of research, it's going to continue to depend on volunteers. And that's something that we need to do. And um, make sure that we are also calling this for what it is, which it's crimes against humanity. And the fact that these killings are extrajudicial, meaning that the judicial system that we have cannot even determine with whether they 
are justified or unjustified when people are not brought before justice and given their due process. With that, I'll pass it on to Jesus. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you, Yvette. <clears throat> so what we have is um, the United States has a history of law using law enforcement to suppress, subjugate, and kill indigenous Black, Asian, and Latino people. It's uh, and it's actually part of the origins of this country. I'm going to highlight a couple of unfortunate examples. First, we have the Dakota 38, which were the killings of uh, 38 Dakota men uh, that were hanged under the auspiciousness of of a. Uh, President Abraham Lincoln during the Dakota Wars. We have the Chinese massacre of 1871, which is at the time was the largest lynching of, uh, in, of, uh, of uh, uh, Asian people at the time. Uh, the Texans Ragers were born of violence and racism, founded as an 1823 as an irregular militia for the purpose of protecting settler populations uh, against native tribes and Mexican Americans. We have a perfect example of the massacre of Boranid, where people were uh, 15 people were were killed uh, under the again the the false pretense that they were uh, sitting um, stealing cattle. <clears throat> we have the Tulsa massacres of eight. 1921, uh, black entrepreneurs, a, a community was killed. And obviously we have George Floyd and a new day of reckoning for American policing. Uh, the data, as uh, Yvette mentioned, is from open source. Uh, we didn't collect any of the information. Uh, Part of the reason that I selected four of the major databases is because if you look at this graphic here, we show that there's lots of errors in, in missing information. And so what I did was compile what I could together into a unique uh, database that merged all of these files. And so the resulting from all of this is, is about 38,000 people um, that were uh, 38,080 people. So there's also a database, again, as we can see here, uh, these are, uh, the, we have to study the, the changes in this, this drop off here. Um, uh, unfortunately, by race ethnicity, the Rasa database does parallel what we have in the, the population of the United States. However, when we look start looking at data by age, we can definitely see the Latino, Black, and Native American people have a much smaller age uh, median than white populations of 36 versus 30%. Uh, again, we can look at uh, gunshots, uh, causes of death, uh, weapons use. Um, now, one uh, getting specifically to the GIS, one thing that I wanted to focus on was just to showcase that where deaths occur, they occur a lot. And so, for example, here we have Ruben Salazar. And at first, when I was looking at this data, I said, oh, my, I must have an error. But when I realized it is there's actually, if you zoom in, there's a killing of an individual just across the street from where Ruben Salazar was killed. Again, follow this, Brianna Taylor. Uh, we have, um, a, a, let's see, as the data move along? Oh, oh shoot, okay. So uh, you can, you can uh, I have the, the link to the story map in the, in the chat there. So uh, we're having some technical issue here. So what we have here now are um, different, as you can see from the data, where there, where deaths occur, they do occur quite a lot. And finally, let me, and, oh, okay. So, um, unfortunately, let me do this again. I apologize. So again, you can you can look at the um, at the the cause of death by different. So let me get get to a point that's very important. Where is the outrage? Um, in the limited time I have, I'm going to actually showcase. This is our sheriff speaking in Kern County, and from uh, his. Oh. <laughs> Let me let me bypass that. So basically, what the sheriff said in the video that um, uh, if you were going to kill, when it comes to killing people, it was better to maim people than it was. It's better to kill people than to maim people because it was a lot cheaper for the county to um, uh, to take care of the death than it was for someone to take care of them for the life. The other reason. Um, that there isn't much of an outrage is if if we look at deaths 
by geography. And so in this case, we're looking at census tract geography. There were 85,000 or so uh, census tracts in the United States. Among those census tracts, one death occurred in 16,030 census tracts. Okay. Uh, in census tracts, where three or more deaths are 4,428. If we look at this numerically, what we have is in uh, census tracts where 73% of census tracts had no killings. Uh, among the population, 65%, 71% of, of uh, uh, total population, 65% of Latino, 74% of white, 63% uh, of black. So in essence, in census tracts where either zero or one death has occurred, it's over 94, 92% of white households have never experienced a death. And so the geography, this geography of disconnect uh, makes one think if there is a, a, a death, then it's obviously going to go. This is, I'm looking here at, at Bakersfield. And in Bakersfield, as you can see, there are not many deaths in the surrounding areas of Bakersfield, but in these four or five areas, there are 25, 55, 28, uh, six or so. Uh, I forgot, I can't tell what the number is. So we have nearly 100 deaths that are concentrated within a very small geography. Um, if you look at deaths by other socioeconomic indicators, you can see um, you know, these are uh, indices of, of a different uh, scenarios of the population. At the same time, you can see where the deaths are. So in the case of uh, David Silva, David Silva was killed more or less right around here. So if you live in Bakersfield and you say, oh, there was a killing of an individual on, on uh, you know, Lake Street in so-and-so, then as a person, you would say, obviously, that's where they were occur. Now, if you live over here in this side of Bakersfield, or and, and you can take any metropolitan area, and you will know where the bad parts of towns are, so to speak. And so this is where you would find um, uh, the deaths to be constant. So this disconnect of where deaths occur and where you live, I think, gives people a false sense of, OK, I live in a safe neighborhood this is not an issue I, I need to worry about. And so as again, as I stated above, and I think in this graphic that, that says it, 95, 90, 92% of uh, non-white Latinos live in areas that have maybe experienced one death in the past 20 years. Uh, and the same is actually fairly true for African-American Latino communities. So the vast majority of people that, in, <clears throat> that, that, <clears throat> that have experienced a death in their community occur in very small geographic areas. So I think that's part of the issue of why there isn't much greater research in this area. And it is a, a, a concern of all of us as to uh, why the outright, so some of our communities, when they're impacted, they're greatly impacted. If they're, it, if you live in a you know nicer part of town, then the data are, are show that there are not as many deaths. And and again, again, I I apologize for some of the technical issue. Uh, you have the link in the story map. Um, I'd be open again. Yvette and I are open to any questions you might have at this time. Thank you very much, Yvette and Jesus, for um, introducing us to our to your um, RASA database project. If you have any questions, perhaps you would like to um, submit it via the chat. I see that you mentioned that the epicenter of all killings uh, occur in Southern California. Um, would you like to elaborate a bit more on that while people write their questions on the chat? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I think it's so important to understand most of the places where the killings are happening are also, are also some of the most populated uh, places in the country by people of color. So perhaps if you trace the places where we have the most uh, Mexican-American populations, that also matches the, the rate of the killings by police. And in terms of uh, population, it's important to, to note uh, even though Black people make 12% of the population in the country, they make 24% of all killings. Uh, with brown people, whether you identify as Chicano, Latino, Hispano, or indigenous, uh, it happens mostly uh, in rate, 
equivalent to the po to the population yet with white americans uh there's 60 percent of the population but only 40 percent of all killings so part of the research that we've done is that we've also noticed the undercount after jesus uh run the data uh we found that brown people had a total of one-third undercount which kind of skyrocketed the numbers uh, when they were run through the Census Bureau's uh, database. Oh, and that's the surname uh, list of yes. uh, Spanish surnames. So I, I it, it's incredible. Again, it, I think in terms of the issue, I think this is something that it's done very intentional because if there's a lack of transparency, then there is a lack of justice. And it kind of pacifies the people, pacifies the movement. If people really understood the magnitude of the problem that as of today, we have around 35,000 people that have killed at the hands or under the custody of the police. That's just alarming. Uh, and that's just since the year 2000. And the reason why we can't go any further back, it's because the data doesn't exist. As the event mentioned, this is a, a totally volunteer-based operation, and 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 that's part of the reason that the the data are collected at different points in time, and different information is collected. One thing I I can suggest about going forward is the possibility of 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 utilizing maybe artificial intelligence technology to begin to address these issues and combining AI with with census data, AI with location data. Uh, we can zoom in and, and get very specific on the information. One thing that I've done in the Rasa database project is to try to bring together all the various data sources of and other like news articles and, and paper articles and videos. And I was actually at the Esri conference, it's the, you know, the GIS conference, and I asked some people, can they go in and scrape video, scrape um, um, uh, newspaper articles and come up with geography, come up with geography and then tie that geography to to these killings. Again, there's 33,000 deaths. And, and in many cases, there are newspaper articles that highlight the, the the issues or the concerns of the community. And here I'm, I'm popping up just this one individual death. And you can see the, the cause by suicide, the location, the geography. And, and in this case, uh, 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 there's no. Um, so in many cases, there are newspapers, articles, journal articles uh, that can be tied together. And so I think within the field of research, uh, you know, and information technology and the power of the University of California to create uh, 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 to create a, a more extensive research item. Kaneshta, I'm sorry, um, Ms. Watkins. Kanchata. Yes, if I if I may oh. actually, I think first we have um, a question on the oh. chat from Daisy, and then we can get to Kanchata. Um, so Daisy Herrera uh, typed, "This is great. Thank you so much for your time and effort with this project. Is there a specific software?" website um, you use to make sense of the data, specifically numbers and addresses? As I mentioned, I um, the JASA database relies on the um, the open source data of fatal encounters, uh, uh, fully fatal police forces. And some of these are actually now gone defunct. And so uh, mapping police violence is the most uh, prominent. It, you may have seen it in the uh, cabinet uh, presentation actually on, on Bakersfield. Um, I use SAS as my data analysis tool. Thank you. Um, Kanchana, I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. If not, please type your question on the chat. Uh, and in the meantime, Kiana asks or says, uh, very insightful, you mentioned that there was um, gaps and inaccuracies in the data. How did you go about rectifying that to be analyzed or could you only work with complete data? Uh, again, as you, you see here, I have a, a, an example of a mapping police violence. So what I did is I, I tried to merge all of these geographies based on different scenarios. For instance, the uh, name, um, uh, if I had name and age and location, I had a perfect match among the four databases. Where there was missing information or, or no data, I went back and ran it through several iterations. So there's been quite a number of processes to get to this point. Um, as far as the naming, 
and 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 the the missing information, as you can see here under unrolls race, what I did is I used the U.S. Census Bureau's uh, surname list of 166,000 iterations of names, and are trying to come up with some. Um, estimates of uh, race ethnicity based on that criteria. So I've used a variety of resources. Um, it, 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 it's right now it's sort of a jumble as far as my processes, but as you can see here, there's a, in this case, we have an, an image of an individual. So again, as I mentioned, if we were to link this data with AI, with other tools, I can only imagine what type of research we could continue uh, from here. Hi, hi, thank you for um, presenting uh, this uh, amazing work today. My question is, um, in terms of what you mentioned, um, you know, I agree that finding a central source is difficult for this data, um, and that's a huge problem. Um, the blue wall of silence is very real, and so super difficult to get. Um, but you also mentioned using AI, et cetera, um, as basically to, as tools to support uh, mining this data. My question is more around like, how does that impact um, surveillance of our communities, right? Because we already know that AI has its downsides, especially with facial recognition, all, all of that stuff in, in terms of people of color. So how do we go about balancing the need for this data um, and, and the safety of our communities? Thank you for your question. And again, what I wanna state here is this is a very narrow project. And so I want to stay in my lane as far as coming coming to terms with the information and the project that was before us. All these other topics are very important and, and we need to continue that discussion, but our focus right now is how to come up with the best data that we have here. And one thing that I have to mention is uh, as far as the government, why it may or may not be collecting it, because this is individual data at the person level from open sources, we, this would not be possible. Uh, from the federal government. We'd run into HIPAA and privacy laws that would prevent this from actually happening. So if it's happening, we don't know. But uh, apparently NHA uh, and the um, uh, National Center for Health Statistics does, does have something similar. But as far as even in their reference, they reference these databases as the primary sources. So there's, I used to be a federal employee at the Census Bureau, so I understand data privacy and concerns. And, and our project here, I, I try to do the best I can, but I know that when it comes to that level of research, it, it just you know may not comply, which is why Yvette and I are calling on something like the University of California. And it's it's the, the power halls research institution that it is to to bring what we are doing here at the ground level into a more academic setting. Now we're not giving up on on our work here. You know I think what we're pr providing is a very strong base, and we're have, hoping that the University of California and the research institutions can enhance what we have already. Again, we're not handing this over to anybody to, to continue this work, but uh, we do need assistance going forward. If I may add, just real quick. Um, I, and I think it's such an important question because as social justice advocates, we know the reality of surveillance when it comes to uh, criminalizing and the mass incarceration of people of color specifically. But I, I can tell you uh, personally, I think that's the most important, one of the most important reasons why we need advocacy. We need people that look like us to continue to do the work and continue to take up space in, in such uh, spaces, right? And that we continue to take the lead when it comes to having this conversation in the narrative of these issues, because mainly we have people from the outside doing the conversation for us. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the narrative doesn't match the realities of our communities and the people impacted by these issues. So what we need and what I want to advocate strongly for is people that look like us to continue to take charge and lead when it comes to having these conversations and doing this type of work. Yeah, we have Dr. Santos as the director of the U.S. Census Bureau, and that's a wonderful start. But we need more Dr. Santos in NHA, in, in law enforcement, in other federal government areas that can, can be there as an advocate for our community, understanding the needs of our community, and not just see us as, oh, you know, those folks over there. We need that level of, of a professionalism within the highest levels of the governmental agencies and, and, uh, and uh, police force agencies that are working on this project. This is a this is really a public health issue. You, you know, independent of as, as I've told people, I, you know, I have four daughters. Uh, 
as a general rule, I would not like my children to be involved with most of the people on this list. That doesn't mean these folks didn't deserve to die. You know, and there are other circumstances of, of that brought these people to this, this situation. Now look at the age data. The average age of a, of a white and a Latino person killed by police is 36 years old, as opposed to 30 years old for an indigenous or, or African-American or for Latino. That tells me that, that white folks get six years of, oh, boys will be boys. And so they get a six year, you know, rent free living before they eventually get killed by police when they're finally gangbangers or, I mean, uh, really, really criminal. So there, there's a lot of public policy, health, social justice issues involved here, not just our collection and presentation of the summary data at this level. There's a much greater conversation that needs to be had. And we need, again, the influence of the, as a graduate of UC Santa Barbara, UCLA, we need the University of California, a public service institution to come up and do this work for us or for the community, not us. Thank you very much, um, Jesus and Yvette, for this talk and for this call of act, um, to action as well. Um, we had an, a last question on the chat um, from Jonathan Higuera. He was asking, what would you say are the top two or three top high level findings of this project? I think you already touched on maybe one of those. So if, if you have um, something else that you might add in the last two minutes. Again, I just want to conclude that again, 95% of the, of the US population is not impacted by this. So for them, out of sight, out of mind, bringing this public health issue, this, bringing this issue up to that level, I think is key um, because it's because it's impacting communities. It's impacting cities. It's impacting police departments. We have research now that says people don't want to be police officers. Um, the cities are going bankrupt with all the lawsuits that are coming down the line, many of them obviously justified. So this is not only, uh, you know, if, if you live in a nice community like I do, you know, oh, well, you know, there's never been a killing around here, but it's impacting our fiscal nature, which is then impacting roads and schools and public health facilities. So the killings of people of color, of any people by police is an economic and cultural issue that needs to be further studied and resolved for the benefit, again, of the entire community, not just folks of color. Thank you. Thank you again, um, Jesus Garcia and Yvette Boisa for joining us today and for sharing this very important work. It's really remarkable what you have achieved on a volunteer basis. Uh, we are now moving to our second invited talk, uh, The State of Black Los Angeles, an online interactive report highlighting in depth the outcomes and lived experiences of Black people in Los Angeles County. We would like to welcome Dr. Tolu Uraola, a senior data analyst and racial equity research consultant for the Anti-Racism, Diversity, and Inclusion Initiative at LA County. We also welcome Shannon Julius, a principal GIS analyst um, on the Enterprise, Enterprise GIS team for LA County. And uh, finally, Robert Graham, also at the Enterprise GIS team at LA County as a GIS programmer and data architect. Thank you for taking the time uh, to share your work with our GIS community today. And uh, please take the floor. Feel free to share your um, screen. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. All right. Here we go. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us to discuss the state of Black Los Angeles County. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Shannon? So before we dig into our presentation, we just wanted to do a quick presentation overview. Uh, we'll be going over an introduction to talk about who we are and uh, where we work in the county. Uh, we'll do a quick background of the report We'll talk about the report data and the technology used to create this report. Um, and then we'll go over key takeaways, conclusions, and then we'll answer any of the questions that you guys have. So uh, my name is Dr. Tolu Uraola. I am a senior, senior racial equity uh, researcher and a data analyst at ARDI, the Anti-Racism Diversity Inclusion uh, Initiative at LA County. And I'm going to uh, give space for my colleagues to introduce themselves. 
Hi, I'm Shannon, a principal GIS analyst for the Enterprise GIS team at LA County. And hello, I am Rob, a GIS specialist also with the Enterprise GIS team at LA County. So uh, just a little background about uh, RD, uh, Anti-Racism, Diversity and Inclusion Initiative uh, at Los Angeles County. So uh, RD was established uh, by the Board of Supervisors. And uh, in that motion, the role of RD is to guide, govern, and increase the county's ongoing commitment to fighting racism. Uh, RD is housed in the CEO's office. And the work that we do include, but are not limited to training, capacity building, planning, policy analysis, policy development, community engagement, and data collection. LA County, as you know, is one of the most populous and racially ethnically diverse counties in the United States. We serve approximately 10 million people. And as such, the county has to adopt innovative strategies and approaches for addressing complex social issues that confront the LA region. And then I'll introduce our team. So again, LA County, 10 million residents, but also 100,000 employees and uh, those, you know, in administration or teaching at um, the University of California may relate. It's hard to coordinate the data and the technology and authoritative resources for all of the people that need to use them. So that's our role in LA County. We provide authoritative GIS data, software management, infrastructure, and training. We are in the internal services department, which acts as the county's central IT department. And we strive to be a GIS center of excellence. And then a small pitch, if you're in LA, we'll be in downtown tomorrow all day. So come by if you're not afraid of rain. Mm -hmm. So uh, for this project, there were two guiding principles that grounded our work. One was the importance of racially disaggregated data and the second was the importance of disaggregating outcomes by geography. So whenever I'm in the trenches of doing the painstaking work of fighting for racial equity, I always keep this quote by Monica Walker in my mind. Um, she says, love covers a multitude of sins and so does aggregated data. By this, what I think she means is when we don't disaggregate data by race or by geography, we either purposely or inadvertently wind up leaving vulnerable populations behind. So that was a good deal of the work that we did here. Next slide, please. So uh, back in July of 2020, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors uh, passed a motion that did four things. It declared racism a public health crisis, they affirmed the impact of anti-Black racism on residents of Los Angeles County. It established our department, which is the Anti-Racism, Diversity and Inclusion Initiative. And it directed the CEO to create a report annually on the state of Black Los Angeles County. So our report objectives are four. One is to present data on the challenges disproportionately impacting the Black community in LA County. Two was to examine the drivers and the root causes of these racial disparities. Three, we seek to establish a baseline to monitor and track the data on these outcomes annually. And four, the goal is to provide recommendations for how to address these racial disparities in the county. So uh, this report, one thing that we like to uh, tell people, because I think often when people look at this report, they think, oh, it's so beautiful and shiny, and we want to do something like this for our county. And you know, one of the bits of um, sobering information that we like to share with people was all of the work, all of the labor, all of the resources and inputs that went into creating this report. So just a quick recap of um, all of the inputs that we used to create this. There were four research teams. We had 1,800 participants from the community, 54 community listening sessions. We uh, sought the uh, insight and the recommendations of at least 50 community organizations. We reached out to 12 subject matter experts. We analyzed almost 300 countywide statistical areas, which are small geographic uh, units within LA County. 
We looked at 36, but as of today, 38 indicators. And then um, in addition to uh, 4,500 hours of research and writing, this report includes 14 ArcGIS story maps. And uh, later on in this presentation, we'll talk more about ArcGIS. Hey, thank so, you, Chalu. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Rob. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, yeah all the context and setting the stage. Um, uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the data and the technology that we used. Um, start talking about that. Um, so we we broke it into these six domains: so physical health, mental health, housing and homelessness, income and employment, education, and criminal justice, um, and uh, like Tolu said, uh, landed on, I guess, 38 indicators um, at the moment. Um, although this has been an iterative process, it um, kind of keeps evolving. Um, we actually started with a list of, uh, I think it was 216, um, and then kind of whittled it down from there, um, partly from the community input, partly from data availability, um, and and kind of, you know, what's available by race and at small enough geographies. Um, and so, yeah, and even with these, you know, 40, 40 ish indicators, um, you know, things like insurance, eviction rates, um, education attainment, uh, you know, this is, it's seven to nine races a piece. Um, it's at least three geography levels between uh, neighborhoods, the county, and supervisorial districts. Um, so, you know, we're still looking at kind of like several hundred data points. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is our list of data sources. I think this mostly covers it. Um, and I think the kind of the main thing, you know, we'll, we can share the slides. So if anyone's interested in, in these links, um, you can follow them. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it was a big lift to kind of gather all this data. And, you know, there were both public and private sources of data. Uh, and we had, um, uh, and, you know, different levels of effort to get them. So some of them, you know, we got a lot from the American Community Surveys from the census. So that was, you know, very straightforward. Um, we can bring things in by census tract. Uh, other things might just be available on a website without any kind of like data table or export. Um, so we're kind of, you know, transcribing things. Um, other sources uh, had kind of like complicated APIs to, to loop into. Um, so it was, you know, a big lift to kind of gather all of these. Um, and then all of it, you know, needed to be kind of processed and standardized and, and analyzed by the team. Um, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. There we go. Um, this is just kind of looking at like our, our data flow and how we did it, how we did it. So, you know, we're starting from all the source data. Uh, we need to like determine what data is available. Um, is it available by race? Is it available at a low enough geographic basis to make it useful for the report? Um, so we take that and then we use, um, uh, we would bring it all into uh, this uh, Postgres, Postgres database um, really to kind of standardize how we were storing it, kind of it makes it self-documenting. We would create views from the various tables. Um, it also en enabled us to do like quick queries of as we we're kind of exploring the data uh, to see, you know, what communities came up on on the top and bottom of different indicators, um, and it and it's sort of like I think I mentioned, sort of uh, self-documenting. Um, we can we can repeat those queries over and over again, um, and as we're going into the next the next phase, so you know this was year one report, we're getting into year two report. Um, we kind of have that as a base um, to go from. Uh, and then finally, you know, once once we ha have the data standardized and processed, um, then we pushed it into ArcGIS Online, which is, uh, you know, a cloud-hosted um, Esri environment. Uh, but essentially, it makes it usable across, you know, their suite of products. Um, so you can make maps or application story maps like we did. Um, <clears throat> and... And also, you know, makes everything available by a REST API as well. So, you know, other software developers or other, you know, projects can kind of tap into it. Um, and then we've, you know, just had it available to use for um, use for other projects. 
uh, as it's as it's been needed in other research. So, um, so you know, really trying to make it publicly available and and kind of uh, make the breadth of the data um, accessible and usable. Uh, all right, I think we'll go to the next slide. Um, I see there's a question in the chat. I think we can, maybe we'll do that at the end or uh, I can answer that pretty quickly with census tract instead of block is that most of the data available is only available at census tract level disaggregated by race. So that's is yes. the main answer to yeah, that's that. That's not just the data point, it's the disaggregated by race piece. Um, yeah brings the geography a little bigger. All right. Okay, so once the data is in ArcGIS Online, like Rob said, it can be used across the ArcGIS Online platform, I think. Um, so the report is a story map. We'll put the link in the chat so you can browse. And it actually, it's not a story map. It's 14 story maps and a story map collection. It's this really interesting dynamic format with dashboards and maps and surveys embedded directly into the report. So even though this is an LA County report, it is, I think, a new type of report that's just much more engaging, much more data-driven, much more interactive. Um, you know, we're not just we're not just referencing a source, we're actually pulling the data in so users can interact with it themselves and download the data from the open data platform. So um, these are four of the key tools we've used. Uh, when it comes to dashboards, we have maps along with lists. So users can look up an address and then get results at these local geographies. Um, so not just a countywide number, but broken down by race at these smaller geographies. How is, how, and, and focusing on the black population, how is the black population doing in these outcomes, whether it's income or life expectancy, how does it compare to other groups at that same geography? So the dashboards tool helped us highlight that. The maps, we were able to show even these global ideas about um, where, where um, in this one, it's um, where foreign born black LA County residents were born in the world. And again, just letting users uh, see that information in a dynamic map. And we had other web maps in the app as well, showing areas of interest in Black Los Angeles County um, or areas that's, you can see that in the survey one, two, three map on the right. It's a dashboard with an embedded survey one, two, three. So we're showcasing, all right, here's the African-American Cultural Center in LA and Long Beach, uh, the California African-American Museum. And then users can also contribute to this map by submitting um, submitting a point of interest. So it's got this two-way communication where we're sharing information, but we're also hoping to get information back. And then data visualization. Yeah, here's another web map. We're showing um, where people are moving to and from within Los Angeles County and outside of Los Angeles County. We're showing key geographical areas as identified by some of our re research partners. This infographics one is interesting because where we have those hyperlocal outcomes, so we know within LA County where Black residents, how what the outcomes are for Black residents, we can actually point them back to the district, to the elected official in each district and say, um, here are some areas you might want to target your efforts, your funding, your organization as a representative of this district. Um, this is what this report is finding. These are the areas that we're finding um, you know, we might want to focus on as a, as a county government, potentially. And then the bar charts, um, sometimes the data is not available at that smaller geography. So we're showing countywide outcomes, always disaggregated by race. Um, and Tulu, before we move on, did you want to add anything on the data or visualization items here? Oops. No, actually. Thank you, Shannon. Right. So I um, wanted to go over the key findings from the report as well as our key takeaways. So if you look at this list here, you can see how the Black population in LA County fared compared to their non-Black counterparts in the county. So for example, on physical health, 
we found that um, Black Angelinos have the shortest life expectancy than anyone else in the county. It's actually six years less than the county average. And I believe it's about 12 years less than the Asian population, which has the highest life expectancy in the county. Uh, when it comes to uh, COVID-19 vaccination rates, uh, Black Angelinos also had the lowest um, vaccine rates compared to the county average, as well as uh, other communities in the county. Um, I think one of the great things about this report is that in addition to just looking at the data and having to digest these data points, is we create we have narrative text side by side with our bar charts that help explain some of the root causes and the drivers for why you would see some of these racial disparities. So for example, on physical health, um, some people are pretty aware that uh, Black Angelinos and Black Americans in general tend to have uh, less access to healthcare, less access to uh, a usual source of uh, care in terms of uh, physicians and other me medical personnel. And then sometimes there are these other historical and sociological reasons for why you might see differences on these different um, data points. Let's move on to housing. On housing, we found that uh, Black Angelinos were the most rent burdened in the county. And rent, rent burdened essentially means um, spending more than a third of your income on uh, rent or housing. Uh, Black Angelinos have the highest eviction rates uh, and they comprise only 10% of the county population but 30% of the homeless population in the county. On education, Black students graduate high school at a rate lower than their white and Asian peers. Black children also have the highest rate of school absences and suspensions in the county. On mental health, Black Angelinos were second most likely to be at risk of major depression or to be currently depressed. On income, Black Angelinos had the lowest median household income uh, which was less than the county median by 20,000. And they also had the highest unemployment rate, which is almost twice the white unemployment rate in the county. On safety and justice, Black Angelinos were far more likely than non-Blacks to be stopped by law enforcement. They're also incarcerated in the LA County Jail at a rate three times, seven times, and 80 times their non-Black peers. Can you get the next slide, um, uh, Shannon, please? So, you know, our key takeaway from this report was that compared to other racial groups in LA County, overall, Black Angelinos are least likely to enjoy good health, housing security, access to economic opportunities, quality education, and freedom from punishment in over-policed communities. One thing that I think is important to note here, well, actually there are a couple of things that I think is important to note here, but I think, you know, in the report itself, it may look linear in the sense that we have different categories of outcomes. So for instance, we have one chapter for physical health, one chapter for mental health, one chapter for housing, one chapter for education and so forth. So even though it might look linear in that way, the reality of it is that a lot of these different outcomes are overlapping outcomes. So for example, if you are less likely to enjoy good health, that impacts your housing security, it impacts your access to economic opportunities and so forth. So I think that was important. I think another thing that we wanted to make sure didn't get lost in uh, these outcomes was the idea that as a black person myself, I know that though these key takeaways are something that is important for us to pay attention to, I think that when we look at the complexity of our lived experiences, I wouldn't reduce us to these numbers. I think we have to look at the richness of our lives and take into account that there are other aspects that make our lives rich. And it's not just about these outcomes, but it is important from a political level, from a public health level to make sure that we are paying attention to these outcomes so that we can do what we can to address these outcomes. Next slide, please, Shannon. So uh, the conclusion that we came away with for this report is that Black people are core to the strength and the fabric of LA County. And as a result, the county's overall well-being and success 
depends on the collective well-being and success of its Black residents. And that to realize this, the county must take the steps to undo the harm caused by anti-Black racism and structural racism so that we can implement the types of policies that will allow, that will allow Black people to thrive in LA County. Next slide, please. So uh, before we uh, go through our contact information and have something to leave you guys with, um, just wanted to talk about some of the next steps when it comes to this report. So after we rolled out this report to the community, we had several community convenings where folks were invited to come talk about the report, to talk about the outcomes, and to talk about what are the kinds of recommend recommendations they would like to see for how we can improve LA County for its Black residents. Uh, we're currently in the process of uh, doing community convenings. Uh, we'll be in Antelope Valley today. We'll be in uh, Long Beach in a couple of weeks. So it's really been exciting to see how people have responded to this report um, and how eager folks are to provide recommendations for how we can improve their lives within the county. In terms of next steps, we are currently working on next year's report. And some of the things that we are looking at for next year's report, in addition to the updated data on some of the categories like physical health, mental health, well, we're also adding a couple of new categories that we wanna look at outcomes for. So some of those new categories include uh, civic engagement. We want to track how African-Americans and black people in the county um, engage in different modes of um, civic engagement. Uh, we also want to look at the built environment, how the built environment impacts health and other aspects of black life. And so when we think about built environment, we're talking about uh, environmental stressors, we're talking about uh, access to grocery stores, we're talking about transportation and things of that like. And then we're also looking at the outcomes of black youth. So uh, for next year's report, which I'm really excited about, we'll be isolating youth outcomes from adult or overall black outcomes to see where are those places that we can tackle some of the uh, issues impacting black youth. So this is the QR code for the report. Please feel free to uh, share the QR code, uh, follow the QR code, read the report, um, and um, if anyone has any questions for us beyond uh, what we'll have an opportunity to discuss today, today please um, take down our uh, contact information and feel free to email us to ask questions about different aspects of the report, including the making of the report, uh, the data and technology, and so forth. We are ready for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. I'll read them out loud. So Donna Miranda Miguel is asking, how is mixed uh, race address in um, data collection? And is there a chart on employment industry by race when you visualize employment data? Oh, that's a good question. So in terms of uh, Black people who are of mixed race, we include Black people who are uh, Black and one or two other races, we include them in the black community. One of the things that we thought was important was to look at um, not only uh, the diversity and the richness and the intersectionality of different identities within the black community, we wanted to make sure that we were inclusive of people who have different identities, who um, have black heritage. So we look at not only uh, African-American, uh, people from the Caribbean, uh, African immigrants, but we also look at Black people who are Black and Mexican, uh, Black and um, Asian, um, Black and white, and so forth. So people who are mixed race are included in the outcomes that you see in this report. Uh, in terms of employment, we did not break out employment by industry. I think that's something that we hope to do uh, in the coming years. Uh, one thing to note with this report is that it's the first year of the report. It's our inaugural report. And so what we wanted to do with this report was to first of all, create a baseline to make sure that we had something that we could track over time, but also share some of these introductory categories so that we can get a sense of how Black people are doing on 
income and economic opportunity in general, and then breaking that out by different industries, uh, checking for the data availability for that is gonna be a part of our process, so. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have a question for Eva about um, what do you feel would be the best way to use this report by educators and students to advocate for Black communities in LA County? I love that question too. Uh, I have an 11 year old, she's a sixth grader in middle school. And with all the work I do, I'm always thinking about how this work impacts her. And so uh, one of the things that we have been working with some of our community and academic partners on is creating a curriculum for uh, folks to be able to go into schools and teach students about this, teach in community, teach at the uh, college level and so forth. I'll add to that. Um... If you are working in GIS, we did publish all of the data publicly. Um, some of it is map data. So if you're interested in doing your own mapping and analysis, um, it's all disaggregated by race. So if you even want to look at a different uh, group that's represented, Latinx, um, any group, you can sort of do a similar analysis with the same data we've pre-processed, but uh, you know, highlight those different groups. So it's all there in the county's open data platform if you want to work with it yourself. Thank you. Just a couple more questions. Um, Conchata is asking if there is an environmental impact component on the report, like for example, um, clean air or um, access to uh, good air quality. We did not address those in this year's report, but our, our hope is that we can address those for next year's report, report, because in addition to looking at the downstream effects of many of these issues, we also want to start going upstream and look at the places where we can create um, policies that are preventative that can help uh, intervene in the lives of uh, Black people in LA County. So that's coming, but also, um, to the question about the environmental impact. Uh, we also, the county also has some other tools that are available where we do look at uh, environmental impacts on different communities. And so that data is available. It just hasn't been threaded into the support yet. Thank you very much. Ryan, do you want to finish with your question? Unfortunately, there's no more time. Uh, we have that final question. Ryan, would you like to? Um... Uh, no, I think you kind of uh, addressed it a little bit. I was just asking you about the appetite for, um, say, presenting the courses or integrating this into a college level course. I'm teaching one that is GIS and social justice. So I just love to use the report or have your team speakers. I was just wondering if that's, like, I'll just contact you, I guess, with the uh, email contact here. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all so much uh, for, again, being here with us today, sharing your work with our community. And um, yeah, we have some very good links, information on the chat as well. And we can probably also share the slides um, that we just saw for the second presentation, um, if that's available. Um, so yeah, I encourage you all to join at 11 a.m. Um, for our uh, presentations on environment and social equity. And yeah, thanks very much for joining us this morning and I'm looking forward to the next presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.